Faith. Talk about faith this morning. And our title is Faith in His Kingdom. And really what is meant is what does faith look like in the kingdom of God? What does faith look like in His eyes and in His kingdom? It's not that we have faith in the kingdom. We have faith in Jesus. We have faith in His word. We have faith in what he did, and we have faith in what he said he is going to do. That is where our faith is. And so this morning we're going to look at that because faith is putting your trust, your belief into something or someone. And we all do that. Everybody in the world puts their faith in something. They put their trust in something. People put their faith in politicians. They put their faith in governments. They put their faith in military power. They put their faith in a job, in another person, in a career, in knowledge. They put their, their faith in wealth and what the bank account says and what the stock market's doing or not doing. People put their faith in all sorts of things in this world. But as citizens of the kingdom of God, our faith is in Jesus Christ. Our faith is in him. This past week, I was out of state for a couple of days on business. I uh, had to travel, and there was a couple of, of things uh, that I had to attend, but one of the things that I had to do was uh, I had to go get some supplies for the office where we uh, work. And so one afternoon after work, I had to drive a little bit more than I normally expected to, to go and get some things, and I was shocked at the homelessness and the things that were going on. Now listen, we have homelessness all over the place. It's a sad situation. It affects every community. We deal with that even here at this campus. So it wasn't that that really blew me away, but it was the magnitude and how desperate the people were. As I'm driving, it was every corner, every street, everywhere on big boulevards, small streets, in shopping, it was just all over the place. And it was, people were digging in the trash, in the refuge. I would imagine either looking for something to eat or something to sell so they can get drugs or alcohol. People just messed up on those, on alcohol and drugs. And there was folks that were, I mean, so just desperate and messed up. It was just People openly doing drugs. And I'm not, not just smoking. People were injecting their arms and legs and just, just out in the open. That's how, how awful. And I thought, how sad. And as I'm driving, I stopped at this place, and I saw in a shopping mall this sign that said, Drug Center Checkpoint. And I thought, wow, that's kind of odd. But as I looked into it, it was a place where people could take the illegal drugs that they got illegally into this place without repercussions to have them checked and inspected to make sure that they were safe for consumption. And I was like blown away by that. I said, how is it that we live like this? How is it that we allow people like this? And what, why? Why would we do this? You know, but that's how man tries to help. That's how mankind tries to put laws and tries to put processes and tries to put things in place to help. And it is not really help. That is a sad situation to continue to enable and not provide meaningful, true help that is needed. But that's the world we live in. That's this kingdom. That's this world. That's not the world that I want. And it's not the kingdom that I'm looking for. I'm looking for the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And one day soon, that king is going to come back, and he's going to take me to be with him forever and ever and ever. In chapter 8 of the book of Matthew, we read of a story of a man who comes looking for help. Like those people that I saw, they were all in need of help. Most of them, unfortunately, because they are so lost in their addiction. I mean, people arguing with no one that was there, people fighting with the air because they thought they were fighting with someone. It was just tragic. But they needed help. 
They need help. And in this chapter, we read of this man who comes looking for help. But it wasn't for himself. He came looking for help for someone else. Someone who was important to him, someone who he cared about, someone who was dear to him, someone who he must have loved very much. And I say that because if you understand in context who this man was and where he entered in and who he came to speak to, he put himself out looking for help. He put himself at great danger, personal danger and risk looking for help. And if you understand this man, his status, where he was, and, and who he is and what he represented, he was a man that was well-known. He was a man that had authority. He was a man that possibly had wealth. He was a man who was respected and hated in the community he was at. He had a, he, this was a man that many looked up to and probably admired. But yet, all that he had, all that he had worked for, all that he had amassed to have under his control in this hour was worthless to help him. None of his power, his authority, his wealth, his connections, uh, his reputation, none of what he had was able to help him in his hour of need. And in this story that we read, he says some things that are very important and very revealing about what he believes at this time. It's important because he recognized that all his life struggles meant nothing in this hour. If you're able, would you please stand as we read this story that we find in chapter 8, starting in verse 5. And it says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and is in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell one to go, and he goes. I tell one to come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished. And he said to those following him, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Father God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that this story you have provided for us to see this great faith as an example to us and to help us understand what is faith. Father, I pray for all of us today. Those that are here, those that are watching, those who who weren't able to be here that at some time might hear this, that you would increase our faith. Each and every one of us has stuff going on. We all have things happening. We all have circumstances and troubles, and we all need help, and, and our only place for help is in you, Jesus. So, Lord, help us today. Help us to hear with our ears what the Spirit has to say. Help us to comprehend with our minds what you are speaking to us. Help us so that our hearts would be open and receptive and that you would deal with me, with me, Lord. And that would be what each one of us says, just deal with me. Because, Lord, I'm going to stand before you one day and give an account for what I said, what I did, and how I acted. Help me, Lord. May your spirit continue to move among us. May we be sensitive to what the spirit is saying. And may we be changed today to be more Christ-like. For your honor and glory, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. It's a great story. It really is a great story when you look at this story And what was going on and what had just happened. Because what had happened is Jesus had just finished giving what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, 6, and 7. He is giving this incredible sermon that teaches about so many things in life. And teaches us that we're going to have trials and tribulations and difficulties and struggles. And we're going to have hardships. And there's going to be pain and there's going to be suffering. But he is teaching us that he came to deal with all of that. 
and that he came to bring life and to bring love and to bring compassion and to bring joy and that he came to show us what kingdom living is like and that he came to make it possible for all who believe in him and who repent of their sins and say, I accept Jesus and I'm going to go in that direction that one day all the temporal pain and suffering and grief and things that we deal with will be gone. Won't even be a memory because we're going to be in the presence of God Almighty forever and ever and ever. He's given this great sermon and, and he has finished giving this sermon. And, and, and he's now coming down and, and there's these things that happen. And the people were amazed. The people were just blown away by what he had taught, what he had been teaching, what he had been saying. They, they were so just at awe. In fact, Matthew makes a point of recording that for us. He says that in chapter 7, in verse 28 and 29. He says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. Because they taught, because he taught as one who had authority and not like their teachers of the law. See, Jesus was speaking the law. He was speaking about the customs, the traditions, about life, the things of God, kingdom living. But he was speaking from a place of having authority and having knowledge and knowing what he was talking about. If you read this, right, there's a difference when someone talks to you about something they've learned and someone who talks to you about something they lived through and they know. And what was happening here is they had been taught about the law. They had been taught about God's way through the, through the prophets, through the priests, through the religious leaders, through, through all that they had. But what was happening here was the word was teaching the word. Right? Remember in the begin, what, what John said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God? Yeah, this was God telling you, hey, this is what it is. And he was explaining. So the people were just blown away. It's not something that, that somebody heard about or learned about or knew about. He was speaking about himself and the truth. And we know that. In life, we've been in those situations where we're talking to someone and we know when they're trying to pull the wool over our eyes. Or when they say, hey, you're like, hey, they, they kind of know about that topic, right? You, you get that. And I've shared this story before because it's happened in my own personal life. And so it's, it's what happened with my children. With my daughter, Sarah. So Sarah played softball. And when she was younger, I was a coach. And for years, I had coached girls softball. And so I and I'd coach recreation. I coached travel. And so uh, there was one year that I was coaching. And I was, you know, at practice, we'd take a group of girls. And we'd teach them how to hit, how to field, how to pitch, going through that. And so I would work with them. And, and I would say, hey, this is, this is how you hit. This is how you pitch. With my daughter, I, I, it's my daughter. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time and try to help her. True. We all do it, okay? So I've been told my, I said, Sarah, when you're going to hit, you square up, right? Get a good stance, be back, swing, swing through the ball. When you connect, don't stop. Go all the way through it. Throw your hands through it. Turn your hips. Drive the ball. That's where the power comes from. Use your core. And so I'm giving her all this stuff, right? And then she was a pitcher. So I would say, hey, Sarah, when you're pitching, when you got that drop off, Listen, Mama, you got to flick that wrist. Just let that ball roll off your fingers. Just flick it so when the ball, when it gets to the plate, the velocity drops off it. And that, that hitter looks foolish because they're swinging at the air. Right? So that's how, and when you do your screwball, make sure you twist your, <laughs> twist your wrist. So I'm giving her all this stuff. Great knowledge. All truthful. I mean, it's on point. And one day she was so frustrated with me. I remember she threw her glove down. Dad, how can you teach me? Have you ever played girls softball? <laughs> Guilty on both accounts. Not a girl. Never played girls softball. Right? So she was very frustrated with that. Some time passed. My wife and I, we got her private lessons with, with a a wonderful young lady who played college ball and was now doing lessons. And, and so Christina was her name. And so I'd take her, and sometimes I'd participate in the, in the lessons. Sometimes I just sat back. And, so, and I knew when she felt really good about her lesson, because on the way home, she would just be telling me, oh, this, that, and then, you know. 
And one day she's telling me, Dad, you know, we, we did pitching and we did hitting. You know what Christina told me, Dad? She says that when I go to, to hit, I need to square up. I need to get. And she said, I need to throw my hands at the ball and, I got, and don't stop. Hit through it. I got to turn my hips because that's where my power comes from. I said, wow, that's, that's great. Yeah. And she says, and then when pitching, she said, my, my drop ball, I got to flick my wrist. I got to let that ball roll off my, you know. And my, my screw ball, you know. So, Oh, Christina, she's amazing. <laughs> right? There is a difference when someone is telling you about something they really don't know and when someone who's lived it. Right? Jesus was teaching the truth. He was teaching about himself. And so when he was giving this, the people were amazed because it wasn't like what the religious leaders were talking about. It wasn't about what they heard. It wasn't about what, what some story. It was him speaking about him. And it made an impact. It made an impact for the people. But there were people in that group that were just following Jesus, as we said last week, not for who he is, but for what he provided. Right? As we said last week, Jesus says, hey, you, you guys are following me because you see the miracles, but you're following me because you ate the bread. You got full. Your need, immediate need was satisfied, so you're following me for that. And what I'm coming to tell you is not about just this temporal need. I'm coming to tell you about eternity. I'm coming to tell you about what you really need, not what you think you need. And so the people were, were following him for that. And he called them out on that. And some of the people, because they were living in a condition where it was very oppressive, where the religious leaders were, very, were lording over them and making it impossible for them to live a life that was pleasing to God, where the Romans were just very oppressive and torturing them and making it very difficult for them. They were living under this. And so when Jesus comes and he brings these words of hope and of life and he talks about a new kingdom and he talks about a change, in their minds it's like, our guy's here. He's going to do away with all this stuff and he's going to usher in and we're going because he's going to change everything. No. Look what he says in chapter 5, verse 17. He said, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the stroke, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and of the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Think about it. They're like, this guy's coming in. He's on our side. He's going to change everything. He says, no, I'm not. No, I haven't come to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. I came, all the laws and all the teachings and the, the religious practices and the sacrifices. And I have come, it was all pointing to this time, me, here, now. And I'm going to fulfill all these things. See, Jesus was coming to bring a change that they were not expecting. They were looking from their perspective. They were looking at what they saw in that temporal moment of how they needed help. And that's what we do today. Many people today are looking for help for the situation right now. Many people today are looking for someone to take care of my problem right now. Many people are looking for an answer to just make things comfortable right now. But Jesus didn't come to make our lives better. He came to show us a better life. And that life is a life in him. And that life is kingdom living. These people are probably saying, what do you mean you're not going to do it? You mean I still have to love my neighbor? You mean I still have to honor my mother and father? Do you know what they did to me? Do you know how they treated me? Do you know that, that, that my older brother was a favorite and not me? And I still have to honor them? You mean I, I can't covet stuff? But I really like stuff. That's one of the laws that says I can't do that. You, you, I have to change that? I thought you were going to make things better for me. How was this going to help me? How was this going to make things better? Where is the help? Some of them are probably saying, hey, remember when you, you started preaching, you said that blessed are the poor. So I'm poor. So this is, you got to bring some change here to make it better for me. You said blessed are those that are grieving. I'm grieving. So what change are you bringing 
to make me feel better because this is how I think it should be. There were probably people in that crowd listening saying, you know, he says these amazing things, but he's not really helping me the way I want him to help me. And then we read the story of this man who comes in. I don't know if you've taken the time to really understand the depth of what happened here. If you really comprehend who this man is, what he represented, and where he entered into when he came to ask for help. This man is a centurion. It means he has at least 100 men under his command. He's a Roman. That means that he has pledged his allegiance, his alliance, his love, his life to Caesar because Caesar was the God for them. This man was probably, you know, well-known among his ranks and respected, but he was hated among the Jews. Hated because he was a Roman, hated because he inflicted pain and suffering, hated for what he stood for, hated for what he represented, and hated for what he did. This man was probably got to this place because he was the most bloodthirsty, most vicious, most awful person that worked their way into this role. He probably inflicted pain and suffering to some of the people that were there talking to Jesus when he comes in and asks for help. Think about where he put himself. Here is a Roman centurion coming to this commonly looking son of a carpenter to ask for help. He's basically saying, I don't trust Caesar anymore. I don't trust my power. I don't trust my might. I don't trust my status. I don't trust everything I've done. I'm going to this guy who came out of nowhere, and I'm going to ask him for help. He's basically saying, I renounce Caesar. Think of where he put himself, not only himself, but his family. Because once his peers hear that he went to this Jew for help, instead of going to Caesar... They're going to turn on him. They're, they're going to want him dead for what he is doing. I don't know if we grasp that. The risk he took. Because here this man walks into a group of Jewish people who are talking to Jesus. And he says, hey, I need help. I got this situation. I know my status. I know my authority. I know my power. I know what I can do. And none of that is going to help me where I am at. On the other side, think of what those Jews were, th were thinking. The people that were there were thinking, what? This is our moment. Jesus is going to give it to him. I can't wait to hear what Jesus tells him. How dare he come into our community asking for help? After all he's done, all he represents, after the wickedness and the vile things that he's done, after the... the, the Awful things that he has said and that he's told his men to do to us. He comes here asking for help. I can't wait to hear what Jesus is going to tell him. He's going to sock it to him. He's going to give it to him, right? There are probably some saying, man, this is going to be good. I can't wait. Let me, let me get to the front because I want to hear every word. Jesus is just going to humiliate this guy. He's going to ridicule. He's going to, this guy is going to feel such embarrassment because he came to us. They treat us like dogs. They hate us, and he's coming to us for help. All right, come on, Jesus, give it to him. I want to hear it. What does Jesus say? Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. They were like, what? Did I hear him right? Did, did he say he's going to go and help him? He's going to go and heal him? How is that possible? Some may have said, you know what, maybe we had a pull Jesus aside and let him know because he says a lot of great things. I mean, he, he's done some of miracles, but maybe he doesn't really understand who this person is and what they represent. Maybe we ought to pull Jesus aside and just tell him so that he can deal with him the way we think he should deal with him. How could he go and help this man? How could he, did he really say I'm going to help him? I think we do that as Christians. I think at times as Christians, we look at people in a way that we say, they have done things, they have said things, they have acted in ways, they're in the situation we're in because of what they did and they deserve that. I think as Christians, sometimes we get hurt and we get offended 
And someone says something to us, our spouse, our children, a close friend, and we really don't want well for them. We want justice for them. That's what these people were looking for. Jesus is going to help him? But look at what the centurion replies in verse 8. The centurion says, Lord, I do not deserve you to come under my roof. But just say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. You know what he's saying? I am so filthy. I am so wrong. I am so rotten. I don't deserve you to come with me. Jesus, you say, I will go. You mean you're going to walk with me? You're going you're gonna to be with me? You're going to help me? You're going to walk in my shoes? You're going to go, me? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? Do you, do you understand? I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy. I, there's no way. Just say the word. Just say the word and I know. You don't, you don't have to go because I don't deserve it. You know, that's what sin does in our lives. That's what Satan wants us to say. Satan says, you know what, you're so rotten, you've messed up so much, you're so far gone, just let God help you from the outside. Don't ask him to come with you and help you and work in you. Sin separates us from God. It's happened from the very beginning. From the very beginning, we see that in the Garden of Eden. God who, who made Adam said, Adam, you're my son, I love you so much. Look at everything here is for you. Everything for you. I want you to enjoy it. And, and every day we're going to get together and we're going to have this relationship. We're going to talk about things I want to hear because that's your worship for me, for you and me to get together, to just spend time together. It's all for you. And, and you know what? I, I'm giving you this partner. I'm giving you uh, Eve who's going to be with you. And you guys, it's all yours. 99% of it all for you to enjoy. Just that one tree. Just that one don't touch it. You have everything. You have life. You have joy. You have peace. Everything's in harmony. Everything's in balance. Everything's for you. We'll get together every day. We'll have fellowship. It is perfect. Just don't eat the fruit from that tree. And then we read in chapter 3 of Genesis, starting in verse 8, where he says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to him and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Just like that centurion says, I don't deserve you to come to me. I don't deserve you to be in my presence. I don't deserve. I just say the word from where you are and I know I believe that you'll take but don't come with me because I am not worthy of it. I don't deserve it. And maybe you feel like that today. Maybe you feel like you said something or did something or you're living in a way or there's a circumstance that you're going through that you don't deserve God to be there and he says I will go. I will be there. I will help you. I will walk with you. I'm your alpha, the omega. I am the great I am. I love you. There is no circumstance, no situation under which I won't come and be with you. Centurion realized how messed up he is, and he says, no, no, no. Just say the word. And what he demonstrates with that is faith. What he demonstrates in that moment is trust. What he demonstrates in that moment is belief in this son of a carpenter. He's heard what he's done. He's heard about the miracles. He's heard about his teachings. And he believes that all he has to do is say your servant is healed and it would happen. And he expresses that in such a way because look what he says in verses, uh, starting in verse 9. He says, for I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell one to go, and he goes. I tell this one to come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do, and he does. He's saying, look, I get it. I know what authority is. I know what power is. I know all you have to do because I have these men who are pledged to me, and they follow me and do whatever I say, even when it doesn't make sense to them. 
Even when I say, hey, go, they don't say, hey, where am I supposed to go? Uh, what time do I leave? Who's going to be there? Uh, if I need resources to get there, who do, they just go. And when he says, hey, come, they don't say, well, you know what? That doesn't work on my schedule. I got this happening. Uh, I'm not really comfortable going at that time. Can we reschedule that? Oh, you know what? I'm not equipped to go. So, no, they, they come. And when I tell them do, they do. They don't start saying, well, I can't speak. I'm not educated. I don't have the financial resources. I, I don't know who's going to be there. I, I don't know how they're going to receive me. I, I don't know if, if I'm going to be criticized or if I'm going to be welcomed. I don't know what's going to happen. So, so I really don't, I, I don't think I can go and do that. No, he's saying, no, these men know that when I tell them to come, when I tell them to go, when I tell them to do, they are representing me and all the authority I have. And they're going to go and do and come and whatever because I have to. Because if they don't, they're going to be in a bad situation. And if they go and do and if they come and, and those who see them know that they're coming with my authority, with my power, with my permission, and that I am not going to fail them. I am going to be there. So he's saying, Jesus, just say the word. Just say the word because I know what that is. I understand that if you say he's healed, he is, it's healed. If you say it's now, it's now. If you say it's tomorrow morning, it's tomorrow morning. But just say the word because I believe in you. I trust you. I'm putting my faith in you. That's what the centurion was saying. This man realized something that the psalmist said in Psalms 33, verse 4. He says, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The psalmist says, look it, man. Everything else can fail. Everything can be misconstrued. Everything can be a lie. But the word of God, it is right. It is true. And God is faithful. You can look back in your life and you can, I know I can, Look back and say, it didn't make sense, but now I know. He never abandoned me. He never left me. It was a bad situation. I didn't know why that happened. I remember thinking in that time, how is this going to work out? How is God going to use this? What does this all mean? And now that I'm on this side, God was faithful. He made it possible. That's what the psalmist is saying there. This centurion realized that He's standing in the presence of the Almighty. He realized he's standing before the Lamb of God. He realized he's standing before the great I Am. He doesn't care what Caesar says. He doesn't care what his Roman soldiers say. He doesn't care what society says. He just knows he needs help. And the only one that can help him is Jesus. And he says, you don't even have to come because I'm not worthy. Just say the word. And it is done. He is saying what Psalms 119, 14, 114 says. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. I've given up on everything else. I'm putting my trust in you. I know I'm a Roman. I'm an outsider. I'm hated. But I'm looking at you. I know people are going to talk about me. I know people are going to reject me. I know people are going to want bad for me. But I'm looking at you. I know it's not going to be easy. I know it's going to be some tough times. I know I'm going to have to struggle through some things. But my eyes are fixed on you because you are my hope. You are my refuge. You are my strength. And it is in you that I'm going to trust. Verse 10. It says, when Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I read this, I'm thinking, wow, does this mean that Jesus didn't know? I don't think that's what it's telling us here. He's God. He knew this time would happen. He knew that this situation was going to be there. He knew how it was going to happen, what was going to happen. I think what he's saying is for those that were around, they were going to be blown away because here's an outsider coming in and putting their faith in him. And he's saying, you who have been with me, you who have heard me, you who have seen, 
that faith. Be amazed at someone who hasn't been with me, someone who hasn't spent time, someone who who's, doesn't have that, and look at the faith that he doesn't care. What happens? He has come to get help. It wasn't that Jesus at that moment says, hold on, wow, I, I didn't expect that. I, that. I didn't think that was going to happen. Oh, no, it was for the rest that were there to see this great faith that this man understood the power and authority that Jesus had. And he expresses it to the people that were there. Hey, I know what power is. I know what authority is. I tell my guys, go, come, do, no question. And now I've come to this person, and I'm putting my faith. And if he tells me to come, I'm going to come. If he tells me to go, I'm going to go. If he tells me to do, I'm going to do. What great faith. This morning as we close, it takes faith. It takes faith in Jesus. And so this week as we go about, I would ask that we would ask ourselves these questions. What hinders my faith in Jesus? We say we've heard we say we've seen, we say we, I mean, we come and we worship on Sundays and we have a, a great experience. And unfortunately for a lot of people who are Christians or call themselves Christians, that's all they come for is to have an experience, an emotional experience on a Sunday morning. And that's their worship. But what happens on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? Is there worship then? Is your faith strong then? Are, are you trusting in Jesus then? Or is there something that's hindering your faith is there someone you haven't forgiven? Is there areas in your life that you haven't rendered to Jesus? Are there things that you, you're holding back because you say, Lord, I, I have faith you can deal with this, but not this. I believe, God, that you can make this happen, but this over here, not so much. What hinders our faith? What about his word do we doubt? What about his word do we doubt, right? You know, I believe that there is nothing impossible for God. But when God says, love your enemies, do we love our enemies the way God tells us? Do we trust him with everything the way our word, the way his word says to? When he says you have to turn the other cheek, is it because you want to get in a position to cock your fist and come back with a stronger hit? Or do we really believe his word? And for some of us, Will I hear him when he calls me to come, to go, and to do? For some of us, we don't want to come when Jesus tells us to come. Some of us, we don't want to go when he tells us to go. And some of us, he is telling us to do things, and we don't want to do them. We're like Moses. We throw up all the obstacles. Hey, I can't speak, or I don't have the resources, or hey, that's the most powerful man, or, or I don't, I'm not intelligent enough. And, and we come up with all the excuses. Is our faith being hindered? Faith in the kingdom of God, what does it look like in your life? What is it lacking? Can we be like that man and say, just say the word, Jesus. I believe it. I trust it. Just say the word. Amen. Let's pray.